today is entitled The Letters of Paul. We are in Colossians, Ephesians, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. Remember, we're doing a survey of the scriptures. In this survey, we will be discussing the letters of Paul part two. Last week was the letters of Paul in Romans, 1 Corinthians and Galatians part one. We'll be talking about the Christ and his church and we will take our scriptures from Colossians and from the book of Ephesians. Uh, point two will be about Christ's coming and we'll be in First and Second Thessalonians. Number three will be pastoral care and instructions. These come from the books First and Second Timothy in the book of Titus. Our central truth is Jesus Christ is the head of the church. Our focus will be on analyzing and applying Paul's instructions from the Holy Spirit to the church. And a golden text is taken from the book of Colossians in King James Version, chapter 1. He, speaking of Jesus, is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence. In our introduction today, <clears throat> I'd like for us to understand that the New Testament is made up of three types of literature. They are narrative, revelatory, and the letters. Point one, the narrative tells a story that would include the Gospels and the book of Acts. Number two, the revelatory will be talking about revealing literature, such as the book of Revelation. And number three will be the letters. And these are the books that look like letters actually were when they were being sent by the various writers. Philemon is a great example. The format includes the following in the letters. We will have the opening greeting. We'll have an introductory thanksgiving or blessing. We'll have the actual body of the letter and then we'll have the closing. The letters were written for specific, um, a real purpose of trying to get uh, the Christians encouraged and corrected who needed a particular word from the Lord in that first century when the churches were first established. By the way, the word is specific. <laughs> the writers were Paul and James and John and Jude, who wrote these letters or documents. And we have them in our Holy Bible today in chapter and verse. But when they were written, they were just one long written form. And it was expected that they would be read in the meeting in the church. The whole book or as much as could be possibly read. And then the next time they met, the rest of the book would be read. So today we have uh, chapters and numbered verses, which make it a little bit easier to break down the actual letter. I have a quote from Dr. J. Vernon McGee. He said, a quartet of men left Rome A.D. 62, bound for what we now call Turkey. While they bade farewell to the Apostle Paul, each was given a letter 
to take to his particular constituency. And these four letters are designated the prison epistles of Paul since he wrote them while he was in prison in, in, in Rome. Paul, as a Roman citizen, had appealed to Emperor Nero. He was waiting to be heard. So these men were Epaphroditus, Tychicus, Epaphras, and Onesimus. Epaphroditus was from Philippi. He has the epistles to the Phil, uh, Philippians. Tychicus was from Ephesus. He has the epistle to Ephesians 6.21. And Epaphras from Colossae had the epistle to the Colossians. And Onesimus, who was Philemon's runaway slave from Colossae, had the epistle to Philemon 4 and 9. And Onesimus accompanied Epaphras. So many of the problems that they were having back early in that first century church, we still have today. The New Testament letters are still very vital to us. They are necessary absolutely to know how we are to be conducting our lives in this generation, even though this is the year 2020. Our first point in today's lesson in the Letters of Paul, Part 2, is Christ and His Church. We'll be taking um, scriptures from Colossians and Ephesians. Point A is the fullness of Christ. And He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. He is also head of the body, the church, and He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself might come to have first place in everything. Question, what does the church have in Christ? When you're in the country of Turkey, you just cross the Aegean Sea and you'll be in the country of Greece. In the country of Western Turkey, uh, in the little valley of Lycus, there are three cities. And the first one of them is Laodicea, and the second one is Hierapolis, and the third is Colossae. Um, Laodicea is probably the largest of these three cities. We're not really that concerned about them. The one we want to talk about today is the one in Colossae. It was just a little country village, actually. There was not a great population there. But it's a very important place. There was a church established. Paul had never been to Colossae. He knew about the church. He was interested in the church. And when it was written to him that there were some problems that needed to be uh, seen about, he wrote a letter back to this little church at Colossae. I'd like to tell you just a little bit about some of the people that made up the church. There was a, a man named Epaphras who founded the church, and there was a man who must have been a little bit uh, more than just mediocre as far as money is concerned because he had slaves. His name is Philemon. He opened his house to be the place where they would meet for church. And he had a slave by the name of Onesimus. In the year, it was about 1956 or 1957, in Lubbock, Texas, the Assemblies of God had an open-air tabernacle where the camp meetings were held each year. My dad was pastoring in Littlefield, Texas. That was about maybe 45 miles or so from the city of Lubbock. And we made it to 
the revival camp meeting services every time there was an opening. And I shall never forget that camp meeting. The speaker was named Paul Lowenberg. He was a district superintendent from the state of Kansas. And on this particular night in my middle teens, he preached on the book of Philemon. I think we may at some point or another get to refer to this, but since we're talking about the city of Colossae, I'd just like to tell you a little bit about the book of Philemon and let you know that he lived in Colossae, that little country town in western Turkey. His master was a <laughs> very, very godly man, but for some reason or other, Onesimus was wanting to be free. And one night, he stole away from the house and headed for his freedom. We don't know how much he stole or if he stole anything. But when Paul's writing about this, he says, I am, I am here to tell you that he has become a true servant of the Lord. And if he has stolen anything from you, his, his master, Philemon, then I will repay it. Brother Lowenberg described that journey. It was a long ways from that little town in western Turkey all the way to the metropolis, the huge city of Rome. And if a runaway slave was caught, the penalty was death. And so he had to run and hide. Probably he made his journeyed during the night and slept during the day. I don't know how long it took him, but it was a rigorous journey. It was very difficult. And finally, he reached the city of Rome, and somehow or another, he came in contact with the Apostle Paul, who was a prisoner there, had his own rented house, and Paul led him to the Lord. Paul writes back to Philemon and he says, I'm sending him back to you. But it would be good, he said, if you no longer care, care, uh, just cast him as your slave, but if he would become your brother in the Lord. And it seems that that is exactly what happened. Philemon was the owner of the runaway slave. And Philemon is also instrumental in helping as he got back home with the church at Colossae. We gather from different allusions in Paul's epistle that errors were developing in the church. The errors were partly Jewish and partly Gentile and partly Oriental. All of that teaching was combined and many took their own interpretation of the scriptures and they decided that to be a, a strong Christian, you really needed more than just Jesus if you were really going to be spiritual. So the central idea of Paul's letter to this little church at Colossae is that Jesus Christ is all that we need for our salvation. There is one mediator between God and man, and that is the man Christ Jesus. All the power that one would ever need is in God, and Jesus Christ is our salvation. Martin Luther caught the spirit of Paul when he said, See to it that you know no God and you pay no homage to God except the man Christ Jesus. Lay hold of him alone and continue hanging with your whole heart upon him. 
one of the old writers from around the turn of the century was a man named D.A. Hayes, and this is what he wrote. Colossians is the epistle which more fully and clearly than any other sets forth the supreme divinity of Christ Jesus. It lays down for us the rule that it is by union with Christ, not by ceremonial observances or self-mortifying practices that we win the victory over sinful impulses of our lower nature. Jesus is our way of salvation. He is everything that we need. And so the answer to the question, What does the church have in Christ? Christ is the head of the church, and when we talk about the church, we're talking about believers around the world. This emphasizes his supremacy, his leadership, and his sustenance for the believing community. Subtopic B of our first point, Christ and his church is the building of God, and we go to the second chapter of Ephesians. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints, and are of God's household, having been built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. Question, what is the key message of the book of Ephesians? The city of Ephesus was on the coastline of the Aegean Sea. You could just travel from there across the sea and be in the country of Greece. Paul laid the foundation of the church at Ephesus on his return trip from his second missionary journey, and he only stayed there for a short time. Priscilla and Aquila, who were fellow tent makers with him, carried on the work while Paul went off on another uh, evangelistic journey. Upon his return during the third trip, he spent three years in Ephesus. That's the longest that he stayed in any one place. After Paul was imprisoned in Rome, he wrote the book of Colossians, and it is said that the book of Ephesians is the author's improvement upon that first book. Ephesians was also written from a prison cell. There are four epistles, prison epistles, and they are Philippians, Ephesians, Colossians, and Philemon four prison epistles. In chapter 2, Paul is again referring to and reaffirming the position of the Gentile Christians. And he says that on their conversion, if you are a Gentile and you are converted, you have the same access to God as the Jews. And that is by the same Holy Spirit. They were now no longer what the Jews accounted all nations besides themselves, strangers to God, but the Gentiles now are members of Christ's church with equal privileges and rights, both Jews and Gentiles. Sometimes we think about the church as just being a building, but actually the church is made up of a group of people, both Jews. If you're not an Israeli, you're a Gentile. And for all of the Old Testament, the Old Testament was written to the Jews. But in the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, we have the Gospels, and then the book of Acts, where the Holy Spirit was poured out, wasn't only poured out upon the, upon the Jews. 
it was poured out upon the Gentiles as well. Most of us are Gentiles. And so it's very, very wonderful that we have the opportunity to be counted as a member of the one church made up of Jew and Gentiles. God supports the church by his power. Every true believer is a part of that particular institution that was begun by God himself. So the answer to the question, What is the key message of the book of Ephesians? The key message of the book of Ephesians is the church which is the body of Christ, and it is called to a heavenly place and to a heavenly walk that is maintained through warfares with wicked spirits in heavenly places. If you're a part of the church and you're really born again and you're really serving God, then you're a target for Satan. But God has given us the Holy Spirit Give us power that we might be overcomers. In point one, we now have a subtopic C, the function of the church. And we're back in Ephesians chapter number four. And he gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ. Question. How can Ephesians 4 help us understand what is meant by spiritual maturity and immaturity? The list of helpers that God gave to the body of Christ that is listed in Ephesians chapter 4 emphasizes the various functions that are needed in the church for leadership. The church has had people who provided corrections and kept us true to God's call. And we can say that those were apostles and prophets. The church also needs people who goes out and tells others, non-believers, about the good news. Those are evangelists. Then he gives the church people who lead the teaching of and carry of the church. And they are the pastors and the teachers. So we have apostles and prophets. We have evangelists. And we have pastors and teachers. These are in intended to help all Christians grow and work together in the Lord's work. We're not saved by works, but we're saved by grace in the Lord Jesus Christ but if we really and truly believe, we will be doing good works. Our good works uh, are, are uh, various and many, many different kinds. Varied. They are varied. We have the opportunity to, to preach. We have the opportunity to teach. We have the opportunity to care for those that are shut in. Some go to the nursing homes. But we all have a job. We all have something that we can do in the work of the Lord. And as we do our work, which is a gift from God, He gives us the ability to do them and the strength and the intelligence to do them. Now then we have the spiritual gifts that are operating through the church and these are under the direction of the Holy Spirit. So all of the gifts of the Spirit that are in operation are intended to lead believers to a deeper understanding of the Holy Scriptures, to develop spiritual maturity and to encourage the body of Christ. So what is the function of the church? It is very, very highly intense work that we are doing in this work, in this world. It is 
motivated and led by the Holy Spirit. We are grateful to God for the opportunity that we have to work for Him. And as we work, we labor day by day in the kingdom waiting for the sound of the trumpet when He calls the church home. The answer to the question, How can Ephesians 4 help us understand what is meant by spiritual maturity and immaturity? Instead of being infants that are easily distracted and deceived, the church is to speak and to live out the truth, growing into maturity as each member fulfills his call and his purpose. Years ago, when the preachers preached, they did not have a lot of finesse. They had a lot of zeal, and they studied the scriptures to the best of their ability. Sometimes they would say things in the pulpit that were a little strange if you did not understand what they were saying. But I remember one pastor who said in the pulpit that he was tired of parting the whiskers to put in the pacifier. I understood totally what he meant, but it was a little strange way to say. Point number two is about Christ coming, and we're going to the book of First Thessalonians, also Second Thessalonians. And our subtopic A is sorrowing with hope. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve, as do the rest who have no hope. Question. Why can we preach and teach that death is not the end for believers? Paul wrote nine letters to churches, including the book of Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. Thessalonica was the capital of Macedonia in Greece and it was located south and west of Philippi. You remember when Paul had his first missionary journey, or maybe it was his second, and he got to the coastline of the Aegean Sea in western Turkey where he would just cross the sea over into the land of Greece. And he had determined that he would go farther into Turkey, but he had a call from a heavenly messenger that said, come over to Macedonia and help us. So he went to Macedonia and he preached in Philippi, started a church there, and went on down the road a ways to the city of Thessalonica. And he preached there, had a little trouble there, he got run out of town. But he wrote these books of First and Second Thessalonians, and he teaches us that we may be sorrowing in this life, but we have hope. And we will talk about First Thessalonians chapter four. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep that they may not grieve as the rest who have no hope. So the answer to the question, Why can we preach and teach that death is not the end for believers? We can teach and preach because Jesus has told us that we have the hope beyond this life. We have the hope that he's coming back for the church. And while he was speaking to the Thessalonians about this wonderful, wonderful realization that Christ is coming back after the church, he encouraged us by how we should live until that happens. And he said, abstain from sexual sin, continue to work, give yourself to prayer, constant prayer, self-control, and so on. And he realized that we will grieve 
for our loved ones when they are gone. But if they have made preparation to meet Christ, it's not the same as grieving for someone who has never made preparation. We know that we have this beautiful hope. It is called the rapture of the church, point B, for Thessalonians chapter 4. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not perceive those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we, who are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Question. What is the meaning of the word rapture? And I'm taking these notes from P.C. Nelson's book, Bible Doctrines. My first point is, the rapture will deliver us from the great tribulation. The second one is, the coming of Christ for his own is our imminent and blessed hope. And the third one, in preparation for the rapture, the devil and his host will be cast down from the sky. I'd like to just comment on this one just a moment. The Archangel Michael will clear the skies of all our spiritual foes, the devil and all his angels, as described in Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 through 12. The fourth one, at the rapture, the dead saints will be raised in glory. Number five, at the rapture, the living saints will be changed. Number six, at the rapture, the living saints will be caught up together with the dead saints who are first raised in incorruption. Number seven, the rapture enables both the living and the dead in Christ to triumph over death and the grave. And number eight, the rapture will lift the saints forever above pain, sickness, and sorrow. And number nine, at the rapture, the saints will be rewarded according to their works. If you have the notes for today's lesson, there are also scriptures that are given along with a few words to describe each one of these nine points. But we do believe in the rapture of the church. And the answer to the question what is the meaning of the word rapture? The meaning of R-A-P-T is in current dictionary, lifted up and carried away. And it's perfectly good English to translate this verse. Then we which are alive and remain shall be wrapped or raptured or carried up, lifted, away, uh, lifted up and carried away together with them in the clouds. And this comes from the complete biblical library. Our third point C is the manifestation of the Antichrist. Now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, that you may not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter as if from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Question. To what are we referring when we speak of apostasy or rebellion? There are so many different ideas from various groups in discussing scriptures in the Holy Scriptures. Some believe in a rapture, some don't. Some believe that 
that there are various levels in hell for those who have not made preparation. Some believe that is not so. So <laughs> we can talk about apostasy and rebellion, but actually what we want to get across is not to be gullible. There are false doctrines that can come by messages in tongues, interpretations, a word from the Lord, or a supernatural vision. And these are not they can bring a message from the Lord, but just because you ate too much for supper and then went to bed on a full stomach and had a dream uh, does not make <laughs> a word from the Lord. If it does not line up with the scriptures, you do not follow whatever is being taught. If it lines up with the scriptures, then you can take it as pure gold. But Paul is warning about those who who are even receiving letters that were supposedly signed by him containing certain claims. And he said, don't accept anything that is contrary to the word of God. The catching away of the church to meet the Lord in the air could happen at any time. He did not really give us specifics as to what we should look for. He just told us that it will happen. We know what will happen. At the second coming, he gave us specific instructions to watch in that event. But the rapture and the second coming are two separate events. At, at the rapture, the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we who remain and are caught up in the air to meet the Lord in the moment in the twinkling of an eye will we'll meet with them and we'll be together with the Lord. Before the second coming, the Antichrist will have been revealed and the tribulation will be in effect. And the near annihilation of the Jews will have been in the news. Jesus and his host will come back at the second coming to the earth to clean house and to set up his righteous rule. And so we say, even so quickly, Lord Jesus. Greg Laurie says, in that moment, God will give you a brand new resurrection body. Perhaps you struggle now with the effects of old age or disease some physical disability, difficulty, or problem. All of that will be gone in an instant. Age melts away. Disability disappears. Sorrows are replaced by pure joy. There is a factor that is presently holding back the rebellion and the man of lawlessness. The Holy Spirit is now working in and through the church. The removal of the church has not yet occurred, but that will open the way for the day of the Lord, a time of judgment. So the answer to the question, To what are we referring when we speak of apostasy or rebellion? Apostasy or rebellion refers to a deliberate turning away from the gospel. You can backslide. James tells us about it in his little book. You can give up your experience of knowing the Lord and go back to the old ways. But that is very, very foolish. We're living in the last days, and we just have to hold on, whatever the cost, to the most precious gift that God has given us, 
and that is that our sins have been forgiven by the blood of Jesus. Our third point in today's lesson are the pastoral care and instruction that Paul gives to 1st and 2nd Timothy and to Titus. Subtopic A, Paul is cautioning believers. He's trying to teach Timothy and Titus about their duties as ministers of the gospel and how they should preach and how they should warn their congregation. So 1 Timothy chapter 6, he says this, But flee from these things, you man of God, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called. And you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Question. When must Christians flee? And when must they fight? First Timothy, Second Timothy, and Titus make up what we have classified as pastoral epistles by the Apostle Paul. Timothy and Titus will be working in the ministry, so Paul leaves them good instructions. He wrote to Timothy personally. Timothy was his young co-worker in the gospel work, and he writes this to him not necessarily to the church at Ephesus, but he gives him encouragement that we still follow today, especially when it comes to dealing with false teaching. Some in the congregation seem to be moving away from the truth that Paul sees uh, <clears throat> back in that day. They are even neglecting family responsibilities. They're claiming special knowledge. And some are practicing strange behavior and calling it good news. The book deals with instructions for the proper conduct of worship in the church and gives qualifications for elders and deacons. There's also special guidance on proper treatment of widows and elders and slaves. I remember back several years ago when there was a, a group that claimed to be, for want of a better classification, super spiritual. And they would see cross, a cross of blood in their forehead, or they would have oil on their hands. Um, <clears throat> there were different phenomena that they claimed. And I remember one preacher that claimed he vomited out frogs. These were all just somebody's imaginations. We haven't heard so much about things like that in a, in a good many years. But Paul warned about these things, and he said, Be careful. Be careful, Timothy, because you're going to be a, a pastor. You're a young man, and you've got to watch out for things that are not scriptural. You've got to teach your people to watch out for things and for doctrines that are not scriptural. Teach them the, the proper conduct of worship in the church and teach them the qualifications for those who are in leadership positions and teach them how they are to properly treat the widows, the elders, and the slaves. In 2 Timothy, the third chapter, he says this, But realize this, that in the last days difficult times will come, for men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, rivalers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, 
unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power, and avoid such men as these. The book of Second Timothy was Paul's written, written word, the final word that he gives of encouragement to his young co-worker Timothy. And he asks uh, Timothy to come and join him before he himself, Paul, before he dies. We could probably call this Paul's last will and testament, his final wishes. He asked Timothy to carry on the ministry and gives him specific instructions as to how he is to teach and to train. Timothy and Titus were both younger men and Paul was their mentor. He challenged them and he guided them as they led their congregations. So the answer to the question, when must Christians flee and when must they fight? Paul gave this advice to Timothy. He said, run away from worldly things, from love of money, from what money can buy, because it tempts us to do all kinds of harmful and sinful things. Fight the good fight of faith, righteousness and godliness and faith and love and patience and meekness. Everybody has to have money, but when it becomes an obsession and we have to have it regardless of what it costs, then and especially in the ministry, then it becomes a snare. That's what Paul is warning Timothy against. Our subtopic B in our third point is wise exhortation. This is in the second book of Timothy, chapter 2. You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, these entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Question, how did Paul prepare for the ministry of the gospel to carry on after his death? Paul, <clears throat> in 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, talks a lot about false teachers and false doctrines. But in these letters, this is more personal to Timothy. Paul knows he does not have much longer in this life. And he's training these two young men to carry on the work. They will have to train young people also to carry the gospel. So this book of Second Timothy is written to encourage Timothy in the ministry in several ways, but two in particular. First, by his example, Paul shows that he is steadfast in the faith and he serves faithfully even though he has suffered a lot. And second, there's a contrast drawn between the attitudes and the actions of false teachers and the attitudes and the actions that Timothy must display. There were a lot of a lot of strange things that were going on in my teenage years. I I uh, <coughs> I look back and see how some things would have been very difficult for a person that was not a Christian to to take in. Maybe he didn't want to become a part of something that was so frivolous as some of those things that were happening. And that's one of the reasons that Paul wrote these letters. 
he wanted us to be grounded in the faith and he expressed so oftentimes his concern for sound doctrine sound doctrine and he writes about the grace of God he writes about the faithfulness of Christ and he writes about how important it is to rightly divide the word of truth When he is imprisoned in this particular instance, he knows that he does not have much longer in this life. And he shares that most of his friends have deserted him. And he admits that both the end of his ministry and his life are, are near. But he claims confidence in his eternal salvation. And this is the thought that he leaves, and I'd like for you to get a hold of this thought. I'd rather attempt something great and fail than attempt nothing and succeed. We get down to the book of Titus in his third chapter, and this is what Paul wrote to this young man. He saved us because of his mercy. It was not because of good deeds we did to be right with him. He saved us through the washing that made us new people through the Holy Spirit. This little letter of Titus has three chapters. And in these three chapters, Paul gives him some very, very vital information and requirements that he wants him to use in his church in Crete as he had given Timothy for his church in Ephesus. In both cases, he states the requirements for elders and he warns against false teachers and he maintains focusing on sound doctrine. This little book gives us one of the clearest descriptions of salvation through God's work in the life of a sinner. Look what he said. Again, he saved us because of his mercy. It was not because of the good deeds that we did to be right with him. He saved us through the washing that made us new people through the Holy Spirit. In that little book of Titus, we have such a beautiful description of God's work in our salvation. Paul lays down instructions for different ages and genders in the church. And Titus in, in Crete has had some difficulty in working through some of the the problems that have to be straightened out. Most of them are not in the church itself, but in the community, in the private household itself. So the answer to the question, how did Paul prepare for the ministry of the gospel to carry on after his death? Paul trained young men in the gospel work and he left instructions for them to train others as well. And so we have the conclusion of these letters. Our next lesson will undertake other New Testament letters, Hebrews, James, 2 Peter, 1 John, and Jude. And we'll talk about the preeminence of Christ and the provision of faith and the necessity of love. God bless you.